meeting of the Barnard Astronomical Society of Chattanooga. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Matt Harbison. I'm good the, evening, Matt. Thank you, Richard. I am the president of um, the Astronomical Society. Currently, the president. We're always looking for a new one. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> Um, and um, I want to welcome all of you guys who are new. How many visitors do we have for the first time tonight? Okay. All right. Well, welcome. Glad to have you guys. Uh, make sure as your as the roster's going around, make sure you sign that. That's the roster for our notes, for our minutes, and all that jazz. Uh, uh, please include your. It, it's too late. You've already signed it. But if you would like to get any information from us, include your email address. Um, and then please sign the Curtis T. Jones Observatory book right outside. Um, it is, uh, it is, uh, it's important for UTC to know that we're using this building, hey Patrick, that we're using this building and it is viable to this community. So uh, you can find us online at barnardstar.org, barnardastronomy.org, um, and also on Facebook. Our Facebook is uh, very well um, uh, it's very well kept and several of our members do a great job keeping content up there and so uh, those are just ways to, to find us. Also we have a meetup. Any of you guys find us on meetup? Anybody do that? Uh, so the meetup is a good way to find us and uh, we try to put maps of where our star parties are and all that jazz um, and keep it up to date. So uh, if you've not been to the... I'm, I'm, we've got a lot to cover tonight so I'm going to try to just go right through it quickly so we can get to the ex the exciting part of tonight. Thank you, Dr. Blair. No um, pressure. What you've missed online, so Bobby posted this awesome article about uh, time zones and daylight saving time. Anybody read it? You missed out. Okay, so I'll give you a brief kind of... Uh, how, does anybody know how time zones came, came to be? Besides Bobby and I, who read it. Did you read it? Okay, yeah. I mean, I've read about it, not that. The history, yeah. So, it's very interesting, and I'll just give you the cliff notes, but not the details. It has to do with railroads. It has to do with people moving quickly across from one place to the next place and realizing, wait a minute, the sun's not where it was in the other place, and there being a difference in time. And then a local astronomy uh, club or society or observatory realizing they could measure exactly where the sun was. And it was almost like one of the first, uh, where it was the one of the first time subscription Sorry, services. So it's a great article. There's lots more in there. I didn't do it justice, uh, but it's fun. Thank you for posting that, Bobby. You're welcome. Um, also, I, there is a uh, there is a video from Chris Waldrop's uh, detail or his discussion on astronomical sketching from the Tennessee Spring Star Party. For those of you who did not get to attend or you missed our meeting where we had Chris here. Uh, this is a great discussion, and Chris is really passionate about it and does a great job. I'll, I'm going to spoil this for him. Uh, but last weekend he was at, is it Starfest? They had Bob Fest up in uh, no. Virginia. Where was it? What's the it's name in, of that place? It's in North Carolina. North Carolina. Not from I got one word right. Something. Yeah. And uh, he bid on a 14 or 15 inch obsession and won. So oh. now this guy, he's a purist, man. He. Every sketch that he has done, he has seen with his own eye for, through the telescope that he turned, he built everything. So it's not like us, or may, and some of you guys may have built your own telescope, but he didn't go by a telescope. He built his own, and then he observed it, and he has kept meticulous records since the 80s. Um, there's about a three-year place where he missed some things, and uh, he talks about that in this discussion. Uh, but it's fascinating. So if that interests you, that's on the website. You click play, you can watch it all. Uh, from the privacy of your own home. And I was going to show you this video, but it's probably better I don't since we have so much to cover tonight. This is um, a fantastic video about outreach and how exciting it is to see something through the telescope. And this guy just went around and filmed. He took his telescope out on, on the streets in the city and let people look through it. And, and the reactions are all like, holy cow! Yes. This is on Vimeo, isn't it? It's on Vimeo, okay. but you can see it from the Facebook page as well. And I was going to show it to you, but unfortunately I... I well, I watched that from the Facebook page. Yeah. yeah, that was really cool. It is cool. It is, it's a great... It's like three, four minutes long. Fantastic video. Yeah, I put it on there about three months ago. Yeah. 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 So it's up there. Uh, it's Los Angeles. Yes. Yes. So, and, and I'm going to... I'm going to put this in there now so I don't forget it later. 
Uh, but tonight we say goodbye for a time to our very own Dennis Sprinkle. Uh, Dennis will be departing tomorrow to Saturday, Saturday morning. Sunday morning. Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Yeah. Okay, you're not going to come to Star Party. I'm just giving. I'm just giving you more time. It's, okay. uh, it's going to rain anyway here. It's going to rain. Yes, Dennis has the right idea as an astronomer. If uh, Chattanooga means rains on weekends in, in some type of old language. But, uh, <laughs> Dennis is getting out of Chattanooga. He's going to fix that. So good job, Dennis. Maybe We're the clouds miss will you. follow him. Why don't you make tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> if it's clear Saturday night, guess whose fault we know it was. <laughs> uh, so this is Dennis's van. He would love to tell you about it. Um, and he's going to drive. You drove it here, didn't you? Dennis actually is going to sleep in that van here tonight. Good luck. And uh, <laughs> he, if you'd like to see it, it's pretty awesome. He's done some some great upgrades to it. Uh, there's a shower on there. You going to take a shower in the parking lot parking out there? Lot. Show everybody how it works. That's right. So he's wears swimming trucks. He's supposed to be homeless. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Homeless with a van. I mean, it's, I don't know what, I guess still be homeless. I'm houseless. Houseless. Homeless. Houseless. But you have a home. Yeah. How do we track him? Does he have a, Ooh. Uh, uh, GPS? That's a great idea. I actually will have something like this. Why would we want to? Where in the world is Dennis? <laughs> that's awesome. I will have that set up. That's, that's a good idea, Doug. I like it. Dennis Bain. Um, yes, now, I'll tell you this. For any of you any of you folks who want some lovely art for your for your home, Dennis has a couple prints. I think he said he, I don't know if he brought those. but Yeah, I brought a few of them. Yeah, he's got some prints. If you'd like to buy a print from him and help him on his wealth, way feel free uh, Dennis is astrophotography best in the club next to Peter and David so uh, absolutely you know you definitely want some of this stuff on your wall uh, but we're gonna miss Dennis so that's all I'll say about that um, just keep sending in your uh, membership your dues yeah that's right I'll pay that through 2019 anyway I'm really excited about the newsletter and the direction it's going um, the, uh, I love that Spellcheck says all those words um, wrong in Ralph's article. They're not wrong. They're all right, Ralph. It's just Spellcheck so it shows them as incorrect. Um, but <clears throat> this is the April newsletter. If you did not receive it and you are a member, there's some confusion there, please come and talk to me. We'll figure that out. Um, I, I want to thank Ralph for his awesome article that he's been putting in the, in the newsletter. And here's an example of what I do with it. I print it out. Here's number one. Here's number two, and here's number three, which is right there. You can see it there. And uh, Ralph has been taking us through the sky. Yes? How do we receive those? Is an attachment to an email? Or what uh, it's in the newsletter. It's, if no, I mean the newsletter. Oh, the newsletter it comes as a PDF. Yep. Where does it come to? Uh, the email address that you registered. The for the oh, club okay. with okay. yep, and if you if you if you need to make sure because it is a it we have seventy nine members right now and because it comes we I, I put all of the members in a CC field instead of a BC field uh, these days they say it's it's not polite to put people in a BC field uh, so I put them in the CC field and I just trust nobody's going to spam everybody I know that etiquette changes like every day it's trying to keep up with it's maddening. But it, everybody's in a CC field, so just take note that if you hit reply all, it's going to everybody. Is it our personal email address that we put down, or is it everybody has a plug email address? Oh, no, it's just a personal email address. Okay. Yeah, we keep a list. It's in our, when you register, it's in one of the forms you fill out, one of the blanks. So Ralph's been doing a great job, um, and um, we've also, uh, we put present new ideas and talk about things going on in the club. I think, we, I think last month we talked about um, the uh, at Chris and his passion and also the Tennessee Spring Star Party and some other things so that's always fun to do um, I'm getting excited about planet planetary season as an astrophotographer it's just it's time to get ready so you got a big opposition Mars opposition um, in in July so Saturn. and Saturn but I think July Saturn was last year at peak this year's no, no, yes yeah, last year well Saturn it's is going the other way now Saturn's going to be in opposition in May. Well, yes, opposition, but closest to the Earth that it will be for oh. another 12 years. Yes. <laughs> but, but Mars is closest to the Earth this year than it will be in 2018, and it's a big difference. So I don't know if you pay attention to things like that, but it's like a 20% difference. 
It's going to be as big as the moon, right? No. Yeah. No. Yeah, so. Is it going to be green? No. <laughs> so right here. No, no. You guys, y'all are just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I heart y'all. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Uh, article in Astronomy Magazine all about the uh, Mars coming close to yes. Earth and how big it's going to expect it and what dates. This is as yeah. close as it'll be in a long time. Yes, long. and it's going to look great through an 8-inch telescope, a 5-inch telescope with some room. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna look great. So uh, hope you're getting excited for that. Even just a view. Um, and then of course Saturn and Jupiter are put on a show every every year, and the Sun, uh, all obviously as well. And then the Moon's always great to look at. So that's what's coming up. Um, anybody doing anything interesting in the world of astronomy these days? Oh, you want my list? Yeah, Bobby, you got a list, don't you? You do. Let's. Anybody? Anybody doing anything on the telescope? Yes. Oh yeah, Micah is getting out tonight with his not one telescope, not two telescopes, but three telescopes on one telescope mount. Good luck, buddy. Yeah. I mean, there's absolutely nothing that could go wrong with that. So. Yeah. I'm um, saying, hold my beer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yes, anybody else doing anything fun with their telescope? Anybody doing any research right now in citizen science? Anything? There's some seats in here, guys, if y'all want to squeeze in. There's two over here. Yep. Come on, back there. Uh, come on, I can stand over here and y'all can sit right there. Anybody else? Ned, what are you working on these days? There's, uh, when the Kepler mission uh, failed one of its gyros and it left a lot of uh, potential exoplanets in doubt. And the, the, the thing is that it's either an exoplanet or it's a double star that they didn't realize was a double. So uh, part of the IOTA uh, program is to uh, chart the Kepler stars as, they, as the moon occults them. And if you get a double uh, light curve, it means it's a double star and not a uh, an exoplanet. Wow. So it, it's a way to separate the good from the bad. Fantastic. Basically, if you want to know any cool astronomy stuff, Ned's your guy. Mm -hmm. Always. He's always doing great science. So thank you, Ned. Anybody else do anything fun? Yes. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows it, everybody knows it, but there's a NASA channel on cable. Mm -hmm. Which uh, goes through a lot of the missions and NASA missions. Every time I turn to it, it's like, it's a space. Yeah, no, you have to. Not that that's a bad thing, but. No, it's, that's the. I wish they wouldn't do that. I wish they'd just, just rerun a show. Yeah. Stuff, something like that. But, Very good. But you have to. You, they do have shows there, and uh, it's hard to catch them. Okay. I don't know if it was this group that told me about it, but Netflix has a new show about Voyager that's fantastic. Uh, when we left the solar. Uh, oh, what's it called? Well, I'll think of it. Heliosphere? <laughs> yeah, something. I, no, it's. Um, I'll look it up in a second when somebody's talking. But it's uh, it's fantastic. It's about an hour and thirty minutes, and it's a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful show. Uh, anybody have any trouble with telescopes? If you, if you have wow. to. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know that's a loaded question. If you're having trouble, talk to some of us. Uh, new scopes. Who's bought a new telescope? Nobody's going to admit it's going to rain Saturday night. <laughs> Are you kidding? We know one of you did, or, or several of you. Have. Um, any any upgrades? Any equipment upgrades? Yes. I've got a reducer for my eighty millimeter. Oh, nice. So I can it'll cover the entire M thirty one. Wow, that that is a on that new camera, I guess. <laughs> very good. Very good. Let's see some results. Well. As always, every month I try to put some of this stuff in the newsletter. Million. So if you if you you know you're doing something interesting, you want to take some time and write up a little article and send to me. I would love to put it in there. Um, I, you know, us doing science together and teaching each other what what we know and what we've learned is invaluable. I mean, I can't tell you how many things Pete and David and Micah, and Dennis and I have learned uh, with astrophotography, and most of it's what not to do. And, uh, and and we always run stuff, like all of us are like, hey, have you guys ever heard of this? And Dennis is usually like, no, man, don't buy that. Which means Dennis bought it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, that it's sharing our love of astronomy that helps each other. So if, you, if, you have, if you're interested in stuff, uh, whether it be observing, sketching, or astrophotography, uh, 
Help us out. Talk to us. Send me an email and uh, let me know. Yes. Harold just sent an email here a minute ago, and I'm trying to confirm inviting us up tonight because it's going to be a pretty night. Oh, I'm wow. trying to confirm if he's playing pool tonight. There you go. Or what? Huh? Because none of us know how to get there. Yeah, I don't know how to get to his house. Oh, either. That'd be fun, though. Just, uh, just go see to Ralph if you want to go somewhere. Just go to Dunlap. Yep. Dunlap. Would this be an appropriate It place? would, Richard. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, last fall I was coerced, I guess, into applying for a Tennessee Consortium for International Studies to teach my Environmental Science 1 class as a study abroad class. And the place they wanted to send me was Cape Town, South Africa. And I have been approved. And they're wanting, I'm flying out on this May 14th as kind of a site visit. They haven't got me away home yet. <laughs> but uh, it's exciting to think that I'm going to be able to see some southern stars and the Magellanic clouds. And, uh, and my, I'll actually teach my class in May 2019 next year so I get to go twice um, but I'm going to be very limited in the equipment that I can bring which will basically be my DSLR but if anybody's got a very small one of those little kind of mounts that tracking mounts or something like that that would be interested to lend me and show me how to use I'll try and get some yeah get some pictures of some southern sites that we don't get to see down here the club. you know what I would recommend I would pack that up and mail it to your office over there and just instead of traveling. I don't have an office over there. Well, you find somebody. I'm sure they'll let you know. <laughs> That's what I would do I, before I carried it. You're talking about uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town, That's South right. Africa. So yeah. we're yeah. we're at minus 33 degrees, 33 degrees south. Because it'd be a lot better than flying with astronomical equipment. Well, yeah. It. See, my camera's <coughs> going to be in my carry-on, well padded. But uh, uh, the weather forecast in Cape Town, South Africa, for today was. Uh, the weather was sunny and 75 degrees, which is exactly what it was in Chattanooga. I shared that with my students. One of my neighbors. But when I go, it's going to be a lot colder than that. One of my neighbors is from South Africa, and her mom still lives there. Mm -hmm. Oh, we hope. <laughs> it's rainy season. Um, it hasn't for the fantastic. last five years. Congratulations, you have to keep yeah, us posted. That's where you're going to have to take your telescope stuff so it's the rain will come. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I'll see you, Ned. Okay, so. Uh, one more time, an invitation to our Marathon Texas this summer. We're doing a summer Milky Way extravaganza, June 9th to the 16th. Uh, call and book your room. There's the number. Uh, there's absolutely nothing in Marathon other than like three restaurants that close before 2 o'clock. So if that's your jam, you like dark skies, this is the place. Because that sign's the brightest thing around. Uh, and they keep it off most of the time, unless you go talk nice to them. They'll turn it on so you can take a picture like I did. Uh, but it's a great place. We're going to be there all week. You can scoop down to Big Bend National Park. Uh, right now, I think uh, they told me there were like maybe three rooms, four rooms left. And you put two people in a room. So if any of you guys are interested in that, uh, we'd love to have you. Also, if, you, if anybody RVs, they've got an RV park there. Uh, but it's a great place. We'll be out all night. There's another society coming from uh, Nashville. I think there'll be some members from there. Or no, Memphis, I'm sorry. Uh, a part of a Reddit group will be there. And... Uh, there's some folks, I think, from Colorado coming out as well. So it'll be a big, uh, this is kind of their first chance of getting, first try to get everybody together. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, myself and Peter and Dennis and David have all been there. So, and Ralph, if you have any questions, you can ask any of us. Okay, so uh, business. And um, first of all, I, I'm not sure where Candy's at tonight. I, I didn't hear from her. Usually she's pretty good about letting me know where. Which is that, so I'm not sure I don't have a checking account, but I, I, we haven't spent any money other than uh, renewal on the website, so I think it was probably around $2,000 where we were last time. So uh, The uh, renewals and new members, I didn't see anything come through the PayPal, so I think we're holding steady to about 79 Yes. Renewed. you re Ralph renewed. So I know she has one renewal. So we're still at 79 <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So we might have went down to 78 There you go. Uh, Bobby Thompson has agreed to be our interim secretary. This is holdover from last month. Um, as you might know, uh, Stephen, uh, oh, Stephen Overall had to resign uh, because of responsibilities at work, and he also had the flu that developed into pneumonia. He's still trying to get over that. So we are in desperate need of 
a secretary because Bobby's the interim secretary and Bobby made it plain, painfully clear to me, as only Bobby can, that he will not continue to be the newsletter or the secretary. So uh, if you can help out, please let me know. Now, this is a loaded question. Would you like to be an officer? Yes, you would. Please let one of the leadership team know, myself, Jim, Richard, Ralph, or Bobby, uh, that you would like to, to help out or you'd like to lead at some position. Uh, we, I failed, and I apologize, last month I was supposed to create a nominating committee. Who knew? It's my first year as president. So um, I was supposed to create a nominating committee. Thank you folks who knew that, did tell me. Uh, but I digress. <laughs> I don't think anybody remembered, actually. Uh, but we need to create a nominating committee. So I'm supposed to appoint somebody, right? I just appoint somebody. I just tell somebody. Chairman, that. yeah. Okay, but I won't appoint somebody. Uh, if you don't offer, if, any, if none of you offer to do it, I will approach you. How's that sound? Uh, but if you would like to be part of the nominating committee to go around and ask people if they would like to run uh, for this office, I would appreciate it. We certainly need people to help out. Uh, it's not a one-person show. All the moving parts, parts of this society take people helping. They, they absolutely take people helping. So... Um, if you would like to do that, please let me know. If nobody comes to me during this meeting tonight, expect a phone call from me. So I'll call and here's what we need. Uh, I'm I'm fine continuing on as president unless you want to run for president. And then I'll, I'll we'll talk. Uh, so probably good to have some experience as in the society for a couple of years. But this is not a hard job. Anybody can stand up here and talk like this and make funny jokes when you get a chance. You got a lot of a lot of material here. <laughs> just, just throwing it out there. So, uh, if you'd like to do that, please let me know. I, we would love to have some more help. And uh, the nominating person will also ask each person if they would like to continue serving uh, and and stay on the ballot. So, I know in years past we've had just Richard was it forever. I think you were every position once or twice, right? No, no. President no. For good. Five years. A president for five years. So, I'm not going to be president for five years. Um, you shouldn't be. <laughs> thank you. Nobody, thank nobody, you. Nobody should. Nobody and it's should. not that it's hard. It's not at all. It's all, I look forward to it. I enjoy it. Uh, but there are times when there's a lot of responsibility. You know, two star parties a month and then a meeting every month. And you just got to corral people. But that's not that not so hard. You get good at it, I think. You get better at it as you do it. And uh, you're all a fantastic group of people, save for about one of you. Just kidding. Nobody here is that bad. Uh, I'm totally joking. Uh, so if you'd like to do it, let me know. Also, um, and I have, so those of you who have read the newsletter, you saw my article about a dark sky park. Those of you who are familiar with Fall Creek Falls know that they've closed the motel, the hotel, and they've also turned our astronomy, beloved astronomy lot, where many memories were made, uh, into, uh, they're going to be tiny house condos. I know, right? Because everybody needs a tiny house condo. <laughs> Uh, especially in the park, because they're going to have electricity and solar power. I mean, they're going to be LED, LED lights. LED lights. LED that's right. street lights. LED street lights. Going to be awesome. Um, and I'm being facetious here because it's not going to be awesome. So we're kind of orphaned. Um, over the couple, over the course of the last three or four years, several of us have said, you know, I'm thinking about buying some land. I actually drove up and looked at a bunch of places, and then we got to talking, and then, and then the next thing you know, David's talking about it. I've been talking about it, and then Patrick. Uh, Sit comes to me and says, I'm going to do it. <laughs> the first one is like, I'm doing it. So uh, we made Patrick the chairman. That was pretty easy. And our thought is, here's the thought. We would like to talk about, as a society, purchasing some land and uh, creating a dark sky park for future generations of astronomers and amateur astronomers to use. So uh, if that sounds interesting to you, I will now ask... Patrick to come up and yeah, give his little spiel. There you go. Right there. Okay. So I kind of spent the last month trying to hunt down properties and get inputs from people about what kind of things we, we want to have and incorporate into a dark sky park. So we started out small and like everything it just kind of grew and grew and grew. So uh, we talked about first doing it for, uh, with ourselves, with a small group, and then we say, well, can we get the, the society involved? It's something that the society would want to participate in. So wh why go to the next one. Okay. Why a dark sky park? <clears throat> so <clears throat> selfishly, we want to have unrestricted access to dark, dark skies. We have Fall Creek Falls, but 
that was like on a Thursday night because every weekend they had somebody there and you know we'd like to be able to go when we want to go and have access to dark skies we could do extended community outreach there um, rather than some of the places we go to they're easy to get to but maybe they don't have as dark skies improve facilities you know we, we do are getting a little bit bigger and it's getting to be a tight space sometimes to get people in we can do some uh, conduct some projects do some citizen science and any other reasons we could think of so kind of what requirements do we have these are the lists that I came up if I asked seven different people I'm sure I'd get a, a list of seven different lists but dark skies I think first and foremost flat terrain this I was asked by my editor to re-edit this at the last second so <laughs> sorry uh, easy access we, it needs to be to a place where we can actually get to it you know it's no good if it's five hours away and none of us go so we're trying to say within an hour of Chattanooga secluded which means we don't want people running through there driving four-wheelers through there that kind of stuff um, Eventually, we'll want utility access to put power in, uh, possibly toilets, running water, that kind of stuff. So room for members and, and outreach, and then also some room to grow. So I kind of put together this idea of what, what it might look like. So starting, you know, beginning with the end in mind, how much property do we need? So this is an idea out there. You may agree with it, disagree with it, but talking to people and getting an idea <coughs> how much property we would need first of all dark sky site so wherever this is going to be located we said that we made an assumption here I want to be able to see 25 degrees above the horizon all right if we get small we can you know we get one and we can look straight up we get a very small sky park but we obviously want something big enough so and I said I want 100 yards square in here for area to, to observe in so a little little trick here if I did this I need Basically, I'm assuming that the trees on the edge are 50 feet tall. I need to have 100 feet here to be able to see 25 degrees to have this. So that really kind of sets the size here at about 614 feet by 614 feet square. If you do the math on that, that, that comes out to be just about nine acres on a three by three plot. And some of the things, we can go back a second, just some of the things we talked about, I'll show you in the next slide, but these are like concrete pads that we put down. We'd want to run utilities in and run these out to the pads, not always, obviously at once. This isn't all gonna happen at once. Initially, we just wanna get a field and clear it. But over time, this may be where we could grow to. Um, talk about putting potentially observatories out there, the kind of roll off roof observatories. Uh, maybe having um, some type of building, like a pavilion that we could do meetings in. So you have room enough on the lot to do this type of thing. All right, so this is an example of, I don't know, I got this goofy picture off the internet. Mm, this guy look is. at that guy. Oh. <coughs> But this is from Marathon. You can see the concrete pads they have. Um, some suggestions: put power up here, receptacle with a little red LED light. We'd have a pad for observers. Um, this is an example of one of those roll-offs. But we'd have, say, a bigger one that we could put maybe half a dozen scopes in um, and and roll them off. All right. So where are we looking at? Um, I'll show you the dark sky map on the next slide. But looking at the various areas, this is Fall Creek Falls. This is a big patch of kind of dark, dark skies that we have within, you know, reasonable uh, distance of us. And kind of the good thing about this too is it's kind of in between Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Nashville, so potentially we could draw people in from other clubs uh, as all those, those cities have clubs as well. So you can go to the next one. All right, this is a dark sky map. So dark greens here are where we have dark sky. All right, here you can see Chattanooga. This is uh, Cloud Creek Canyon. This is a, a dark sky spot that's kind of on the Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee border. This is the kind of area that I'm focusing on. There's also some area out here in, in um, North Carolina. I chose this kind of, it's close by and it's also entirely within Tennessee. So, go ahead. So just zooming in on this, again, Fall Creek Falls, keep going and just kind of trying to zoom in to give people an idea. And where I've been limiting my hunt to so far is this area right here. I've looked at a couple of properties. Um, the most suitable right here was was about five acres. So I think we're still looking for other properties. We potentially had a, there's another lot next to this, which is another five acre lot. We could potentially get that 10 acres that we want. Um, but we haven't found anything perfect yet or it'll meet that vision that I showed at the beginning. All right, again, this is just kind of the area. If you go uh, down Baker Mountain Road, go ahead. Um, this is another property I looked at, which was two acres. Again, it's, it's all going to depend on size. Uh, again, in that development, there was a development that went bankrupt. You have a lot of properties out there, but they're all owned by individual people. 
and those people are kind of scattered all over the country at this point. So we're trying to track some of them down and see what we can get. Keep going. That's just another. All right. This was the primary property we looked at. This one's five acres, um, which is for sale. They listed for 18 is what we're talking about. Potentially, we can get it for less than that. We're trying to find out if this property is available. We've identified the owners, but we're trying to contact them and, and uh, see if they're willing to sell. They live in Florida. So just an idea of what the property is like. We have uh, utilities here, utility lines. The utilities will run power 1,500 feet without charging anything. So pretty much get any place on the property. Um, and that's an example of what a football field size opening would look like on that property. OK, keep going. Um, just an example of what you could see with certain types of viewing. Keep going. Keep going. All right, this is where we are now, deep in the red. So you have an idea of reference to what kind of skies we're under. Uh, this is Harrison Bay. And then Cloud Bend Canyon is right down here. So all those sites, even if you, if you think they're dark, they're kind of dark. They're not really that dark, though. OK. This is an example of Fall Creek Falls, the site we lost. So this site is about half of uh, kind of that five acres. That's about two and a half acres, the observing site that we would, had been using out there. And a close up of that. Another thing I wanted to kind of bring up where we might be able to go, there's a, anybody familiar with Deer Lake uh, Astronomy Park? Okay. Um, so I kind of looked at that and looked at, and I, Matt, I guess you <coughs> talked to him, right? Well, the president got an email. Okay. So. so that's about three and a half, four hours. I just want to make you aware of that. But, uh, they did something interesting where they actually created a village around uh, the astronomy. They basically bought it. They set up, had people buy in, buy land, set up their own observatories. Longer term, this might be something that we could evolve this into. And this is just an example of what, there's the observing field, and then they have this track of land down here, and they've got observatories all over the, you know, people have their own observatories set up there. It's pretty interesting. And from what I gathered, they bought the, the field first and added the land as they went, as they grew. It's uh, about an hour uh, east of Atlanta. It takes three and a half hours to get there from here. It's near Augusta. Yeah. With no traffic. With no traffic. It takes four and a half hours to get there on a good day through Atlanta. That's about right. On a bad day through Atlanta? Two days. You might want to stop. <laughs> You're going to stop overnight. Right. So we could find some place like that in, that in that area. There is quite a bit of land up there, but not for the budget that we have. So, I mean, there are tracks, literally five and six hundred acre tracks of land available around Fall Creek Falls, but they're wanting five hundred thousand dollars. I don't think that's the budget. <laughs> so, all right, yeah, keep, keep going. And this is just an example of their website where you can go in and um, probably to. to uh, get back some of the costs if we have people come in and maybe use pads, those kind of things, we could have this type of program set up similar to Deer Lick. So they have, this is an example of somebody who is doing something to uh, kind of monetize that and be able to finance that going forward. So, all right, I think that's it. Thank Any you. questions for me? All right. And um, I just say, you know, we're, those, oh, question? Yes. Yes. You remember me? I do. Who are you? <laughs> that was Ralph that said that right over here. <laughs> uh, I'm with the guys with the Falls Astronomy and Parks. I appreciate y'all coming down. We've had this going on for many years. Uh, we we at one time I didn't get a chance to work with putting out the information to all the clubs this year because we're busy. Usually we've got the guys we've seen, you know, people pass away and move on, but we're not giving up, and we don't know the future, but the areas you were talking about, about Fall Creek Falls, it is very dark, it's very nice. Yeah. And we're glad your guys have been working with us, we want to work with you, because this is a great thing that we enjoy, and we like more people to continue as generations go on. Please keep me informed, because I'm going to be dealing with my friends up there. I live in Lynchburg, so I came all the way from over here, but I go up there. Yeah. And uh, let me know, and I can pass that information if you want, and see how we can help you guys. Absolutely. I'll be in touch with all you guys. Who are you? JD. My name is Bill Madewell, and I'm with uh, 
I belong to the Cumberland Astronomical Society up there toward uh, Lebanon or Gallatin, but I also am with uh, Astronomy in the Parks. And we've been doing the Fall Creek Falls thing for almost 20 years. Yep. So it's going through different cycles. And we appreciate you guys being here. Yeah. It was our pleasure. Well, it's, and it's our love of that place that's got us thinking this direction. You know, if you have, it, you, you look at some of those monies involved, and, and you know, we, we're talking about people going in and putting money involved, you know, putting money down to, to secure this place with the idea that we donate it to the society, and then the society picks up liability insurance, so that's a yearly fee, and, our in, and, and we do membership like they do at Deer Lake. So it could be done, and it, and it might not be all the monies that you would think, um, but it might be something that really grows our society and gives us a place to do research. For those of us who don't have roll-off observatories or a great sky to use, uh, this would be a great place to do science, and do it as a, as a club. I mean, Ralph's Top To It articles really got me inspired to get out with my dog anytime I can uh, to find these things, you know, to see what I can see, to let those photons hit my eye. So I appreciate uh, what Ralph has started and what some of you are, are, are excited to do. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know. I have uh, asked Patrick and David Frost, Patrick Sick and David Frost, to be our chair and co chair. And so they're kind of, they went, they've gone and looked at properties and and so we're talking about this. If you would like to be part of this, part of the monetary side of it, so that you're going to donate, you'd like to donate some money towards it, please let us know um, because our goal, our goal is to donate this back to the society. So we're going to need a committee for that, and that's a whole other ball game. Um, so there's a lot of things to navigate, but we can do this. So, so that we don't go in, over here tonight, I want to just remind you of all the upcoming events. Oh, before I do this. Uh, we need to accept the minutes that were in the newsletter uh, from February and March through our interim secretary. Yes, Lee. Make a motion to accept the minutes second. in February and March. And second. Carry. Okay, second. All right. So we got that. And you got that. You're making minutes there, right? I hope. <laughs> so too, Bobby. Okay. Thank you all. Um, the minutes are uh, carried. So. Um, Upcoming events Thursday, that's today. Uh, Dr. Samantha Blair's here, and uh, uh, we're excited about that. On Saturday, we have our Harrison Bay Star Party. The weather looks, it just does not look good. Uh, but we will have a rain or shine program on Mars coming up uh, Saturday night at 8 p.m. I will be there. If you want to come hang out with me, please do, because I'll be there by myself if you don't. Uh, Saturday, May 5th is our Cloudland Canyon Star Party. So the way this is going to work all the way through September, First weekend, first Saturday of the month, Cloudland Canyon. Second Saturday of the month, Fall Creek Falls. Or, sorry, Harrison Bay State Park. Uh, so please try to come to both if you can. Uh, our numbers, they seem to grow every time we have one. We've had as many as 500 people out there. So we need you, and we need your telescope out there. Joe, would you like to say something? Well, yeah, I just want to make a correction. I don't think that Cloudland Canyon is always on a specific Saturday. Okay. Well, if, if, you, it, if it is, it's it's by accident because I didn't I didn't set it up that way. Okay. All right. I thought we talked, and I but I could be wrong. So, no. do you know if it's May fifth? It is May. 5th. It is May fifth, but the, the the ones after that, I don't know. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll I'll let everybody know. I'll we'll send I'll send the uh, I'll send you if you don't have the the whole program for the year. I'll send it to you, and then okay. you could. That'd be great. Send it out to <coughs> Yes. Uh, about a half a year ago, my wife and I we, uh, drove down the road that went on this mountain here that runs north and south. Yep. And uh, we came across a uh, place that looked like an observatory and we stopped and quieter. And I don't remember the exact details. The thing that stands out in my mind is the guy that was there, he was said it was very underutilized. Huh. And it was, uh, I'm not sure if there was a planetarium or a telescope there. There was a dome there, and that's what attracted me. You sure, look out mountain. Are you sure you yeah. want Sand Mountain? Because no, no, the University of Alabama the has it. If you get at the mountain, it ends here and runs south. Yeah. On 85 miles. On, uh, <laughs> uh, on the west sure. west of Chattanooga. Right. Immediately west of Chattanooga. That's starts just about a little bit above Chattanooga and it runs south 
and we went down, we were well into Georgia before okay. we got to the far end of it where we went down because it's lengthwise type my mountain. Oh, did you go to Cedartown? Huh? You going down to Cedartown? Uh, I don't know. We were just you went out, the end uh, of, of 150. We weren't going anywhere except to drive, and we gotcha. we came across this place and it looked like an observatory. And I stopped, and uh, yeah, you know, uh, there was a guy there and talked to him, and uh, and it was some sort of an astronomy facility. But it was, you know, like you said, it was uh, underutilized. Was uh, his exact words. Well, if any of you guys know of any but place, would it be a problem at being in Georgia? No, well, there there could be an issue there with our five hundred one c three and owning property in Georgia. So oh, no, I'm not talking about owning property. I'm talking about <coughs> let us use their property. Oh well, uh, to observe. So that's a possibility as well. But then then there's insurance involved. So I don't know how that would work, and that's certainly something that we're we're going to look at, and it is. Uh, I've got someone right now asking all those questions to get, so I'll have more information. How does the insurance work at the current stuff? It's, party? well, it's current stuff that's a good question. That's all stuff we're figuring oh, out okay. as well as we go through this. <laughs> right. right now, it, it falls all, it falls back to Harrison Bay. So, that's the reality of wherever we're at, that's where the, the liability is. So, yes? What's the timing at Harrison Bay? Uh, we're at dusk. So as soon as it gets dark right now, it's like eight. I mean, seven forty-five, eight somewhere in there. Is there a cutoff time? You know, those guys—they're great to let us stay as long as we want to stay. I mean, I've stayed there all night before with my telescope and imaged. So they and they were fine with it. In fact, once I told them I was there, they brought me coffee. So yeah, I've been out there late. And I yeah, talked to them, but it's yeah. kind of like I didn't know if it's like that. You know, overstaying your welcome because you're there. No, they're pretty good. But I will tell you that they—they they can't control who's in that parking lot. Sun, you know, Sunday morning, and. Uh, there could be some rowdy people in there Sunday morning, so you might not want to have your expensive telescopes out there. Any other questions? Okay, don't forget you can you can join online. All that's up there. Uh, real quick, here's the photos people have taken this month. Good job, David. Beautiful. Rosette. Dennis did this at Fall Creek Falls when he wasn't trying. This is his mm. practice image. I know, right? That's only one night. I'm doing you, me. So here's mine. Uh, so I want to point out panel number 26 because this is panel number 26. Looks great. I know, I like it too. There's nothing there. So the C26, there's a lot over there, but nothing over there. So I, it's going to take me seven years until I'm done with that. Uh, and then uh, this was the sky at Cloudland Canyon. Nice, right? Yeah. Here's uh, here's some stars right here. Here are, the, here are the brave folks. I'm wearing shorts today, and I couldn't feel my face in this picture. It was wow. so cold. It's not even funny. So uh, thanks to everybody who come up and froze with us. Joe wasn't here. He was on the phone talking to his fan club when the picture, but he was there with us. Uh, here is here is uh, Chris Waldrop's new dob that he bought in auction. He's all excited about. It. He's not here, but there it is. And uh, <clears throat> So tonight, to get to the point, we have Dr. Samantha Blair with us, and Dr. Blair is the professor of astronomy and physics at uh, Dalton State <laughs> Assistant uh, Professor of Associate. Associate. Okay. Associate. Oh, nice. Important. They need to fix that <laughs> website then, because <laughs> <laughs> I looked that up. Um, and she does amazing work there. For those of you who came with us in November to see the the uh, their their new facility. Here it is. Uh, it is a beautiful instrument, and they're doing some amazing things there. I think kids are getting excited about astronomy. Here it is, looking at Orion, and here's the first light out of there. There's the surprising the dark skies that night. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it it, it is. Uh, it is a beautiful place, and if you look at the dark sky map, it looks great there. So, without any further ado, Dr. Blair, thank you so much. Do you want to use the clicker, or do you want me to do it for you? It. You just touch it. Just touch it. Yeah, you, see, you touch that, and it goes. And then if you want to go back, you just swipe it, and it goes back. So touch for forward, yep. swipe. Yep. And if my wife texts, just don't answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, just go ahead and talk. Hey, Mel, you still need this? Sure you still need this? Yeah, you done it. Did you go back? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, you just tell me. Uh, I'll handle it. You still need the internet? Uh, yeah. It'll, it'll quit. Is it you? Is your phone getting hot? 
<laughs> it's a little warm. Okay. No. And that was like a 10 second exposure <coughs> for that first light image on uh, um, wow. our telescope. So I'm Samantha Blair. I teach physics and astronomy at Dalton State College. And um, I'm not a cosmologist. And I did take a cosmology course in grad school by someone who was not a cosmologist. So <laughs> the cosmology I know is very limited. I do know uh, tensor algebra. That's what I do remember about that that course. And so what I wanted to do was go through this for myself. And so what I know I have in here, and I'm going to dump off in, to you guys, I don't know much more. And if you have any serious questions, um, give me your email. I'll find the answers and get back with you. So I'm going to talk about cosmology, the Big Bang, where it started, and, and where people think it's going. So what is the science of cosmology? It's concerned with the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. So that's everything dealing with the universe. And it answers questions like, how did the universe begin? How large is the universe? How long has it existed? How has it changed over time? And what is the ultimate fate of our universe? So one of the fundamental questions um, that troubled people like Kepler, and also troubled Heinrich Olbers, who was a German um, amateur astronomer in the 1800s, was why is the sky dark? Because the, um, the belief about the, sol about the universe, um, Sir Isaac Newton perpetuated this belief also, is that the universe is static, it's infinitely old, um, it has existed forever and will exist forever, and time moves on at a uniform rate in all parts of the universe, okay? So it's static, um, and nothing is, is moving, time is exactly, um, what would I say? The time doesn't change, essentially, and it's uniform. And so by that, um, using that thought, Every line of sight we look along, if everything is randomly distributed as it should be, every line of sight we look upon should have a star, okay? So that means that the night sky and the daytime sky should be equally bright, but it's not. And so Kepler puzzled with this, um, Olbert puzzled with this, other people did too, because they couldn't understand why the night sky is not as bright as the daytime sky. And so that's what's called Olbert's paradox. Now, Einstein came along, next slide, and he upended the static view, okay? Because he came along with his two tenets, the idea of special relativity and um, general relativity, okay? And special relativity essentially says that time and length are relative, okay? And um, general relativity says that gravity curves the fabric of space. Now, Newton said the universe is a framework, a very rigid framework where everything is placed in there nicely. Einstein came along and said, no, uh -uh. gravity bends, curves space. So this was completely foreign and unknown, but um, it explains why we don't see a star at every point, okay? And so Einstein did calculations and what he found was that the universe was either contracting or expanding, okay? And, what, you need to go back. Oh, <laughs> He, he uh, found out that it was either contracting or expanding, and he was desperately trying to keep the universe static, okay? He, he believed Newton, he said, look, that the universe is static. So he created something called the cosmological constant, which was a pressure that caused the universe to expand. So instead of it contracting, he had this, this uh, force, essentially, that would keep the um, universe from contracting. So it kept it at, at a stable state, and he, this was a cosmological constant. Now, he called it the greatest blunder of his life, okay? Next slide. Because Edwin Hubble came along, and he, um, one thing he did was, um, in the Curtis Shapley debate, which they were arguing over whether uh, nebulae were um, really close to us or really far away, and Edwin Hubble came up and said, you know what, space is actually expanding, all right? The universe is expanding, and those, those uh, island nebulae are actually really far from us. And he came up with the Hubble Law. And the Hubble Law uh, relates the recessional velocity of a galaxy to its distance from Earth, 
by a constant, which is the Hubble constant. So the Hubble constant today, the H naught, is 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Parsec is a distance, a unit of distance that radio astronomers like to use, not optical people. Uh, they like to use light years. But um, so the Hubble law um, essentially lets us know that a galaxy twice as far away is receding twice as fast. So our, un our universe is expanding. But it's not expanding the way we would think. Um, expansion doesn't mean that galaxies are getting further away from each other, that, that stars in the galaxies are coming apart. No. The galaxies are like the chocolate chips in our bread right here. And as the bread grows, the chips move with the bread, but the chips don't separate. So the chips are like galaxies. And um, in this expansion model, um, all the galaxies and large clumps of matter stay together, but the space itself expands. So there are a couple of things to look at with this. Okay, First, um, you might think the expansion of the universe means as time goes by, galaxies move further away from each other through empty space. This isn't the case. Okay, And this is the mind-blowing part. The expansion of the universe means that as time goes by, space itself, itself is expanding. Okay, So as space is expanding into itself, the galaxies are carried with it. So you can see here, this, this um, grid right here is stable and the galaxies are moving on it. This grid is enlarging and that's what's happening. Next please. Um, you may think the redshift of light from a distant galaxy is what's called the Doppler shift. It occurs because the galaxies are moving rapidly away from us. Well, that's not true, okay? We do use redshift to see whether things are moving towards us or away from us, but that's on a very small scale, okay? And that's a different kind of shift, all right? And I'll talk about that here shortly. The reality is, as a photon travels through intergalactic space, its wavelength actually expands. It's being stretched, okay, through space while it's traveling. This is called a cosmological redshift. So I will give you um, a definition, a distinction between these two types of redshifts shortly, but that lets you know that there is a difference. As the universe expands, so do objects within the universe. Hence, galaxies within a cluster are more spread out than they were billions of years ago. Like I said, with the chips and the cake, that's not true. At first, the expansion of the universe tends to pull the galaxies of the cluster away, but the force of gravitational attraction binds the members together. So at a certain size, that cluster will stabilize. So that's just some of the things that people have thought about the expansion, just to get your mind um, set on what's actually going on, or what the cosmologists think is actually going on. So let's distinguish between cosmological and Doppler redshift. In the Doppler effect, Christian Doppler, um, I think it was 1675 or something, um, thought, well, you know, um, the wavelength should probably change based on motion of the source of the observer, all right? And um, you can hear this. As this uh, ambulance approaches, the wavelength here starts to get, you know, bunched together. You hear a higher pitch. Eee! You know, the ambulance is coming towards you. Eee! Then, let's say the ambulance passed him, let's just flip this all the way, and it's moving away from him, you hear the, you know, you hear the lower pitch, okay, and it's like the, the wavelength is stretched out, okay? Now that's a Doppler redshift, okay? That's a Doppler redshift. A cosmological redshift is the physical stretching, I love this, the physical stretching of the wavelength of the wave. So this is a real physical stretch. All right, and that's the difference between these two types of redshift. Now, the look back time, um, so as we talk about um, looking at objects in space, we can talk about something called the look back time, and it refers to how far in the past you look when you're looking at an object, how far back you're seeing. Because all of us who are doing astronomy in here know that when we're looking at an object, we're not seeing the light as the object is now. That light has time, that it takes to, to, in, to travel, those photons take time to enter your eye, okay? And so, um, by virtue of the fact that it takes time for it to travel here, that object has actually moved so, so many more, you know, so much more the distance that it, um, 
um, the light has traveled, it's moved that much further out. So we're effectively looking in the past when we look into space. And so there's something called the redshift, or Z, which we can um, find by looking at the wavelength of the light that we're looking at. So we have um, an unstretched wavelength, which would be the wavelength we know that we should be seeing, and then we have the wavelength that's been shifted, okay? Now if we do a ratio of these, we have the degree of stretching that's occurred, and we can um, put that degree of stretching equal to 1 plus D. If we just rearrange this equation, all right, we get 1 plus C. So what does this mean in terms of looking at a galaxy at a certain redshift? Well, for a galaxy at z equals 3, the universe has expanded by a factor of 4 since light left that galaxy. So it gives you an idea of how much the universe has expanded since the light has left that galaxy. And so when we get z numbers, we kind of know how far out that object is, and we know how far back in time we're looking, okay? So this idea of Z, or this redshift, we'll be using and looking at as we go through the phases of um, the evolution of the universe. Okay. Now the cosmological principle states basically that the universe is homogeneous, okay, which means every region in the universe is the same as the other, okay, and isotropic which means every direction we look at in the universe is going to look absolutely the same. And so, you may think, well, we're probably in the center of the universe. Well, everybody's in the center of the universe. The center of the universe is everywhere. So if you took a, um, an offset, um, what would be a plate of stars, and you moved it around and centered it, you would find that everywhere you moved it, the center would be right where you were, okay? And um, I wish I could show you that. I don't have a video or anything to show that. But basically, we are not necessarily the center. Everywhere in the universe is essentially a center, okay? There is not necessarily a center of our universe, okay? And the event that ushered in the creation of this universe is the Big Bang. And the thing about the Big Bang is, there's no specific location and place like a bomb exploding that we can trace all this stuff back to and say, ah, oh, the Big Bang started right here. Because the Big Bang started the expansion of space that we're expanding into. So apparently there was nothing, and then there was space. So it's not like the Big Bang um, started and then went into space that was already there. There was nothing there, and the Big Bang created the space that was, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> Mind-blowing to me, I'm sorry. But um, we can estimate the age of the universe, okay, which is our time here. Now we know that um, distance over speed is time, and so distance divided by our uh, recessional velocity gives us one over the Hubble constant. And when we do the inverse of the Hubble constant and do some um, conversions, which I didn't put up here, we get 13.4 billion years. Now, the expansion rate hasn't always been the same. So if we, the cosmologists have done a little um, messing with the numbers there to um, account for this variation in expansion rate, we get our 13.7 billion years plus or minus 0.2 billion years. So that's how we've come up with the age of our universe, our 13.7 billion year age. Now, let's come back to uh, Olber's paradox and explain why we know that, um, you know, it's not really a paradox, we know why it's not the case. So, um, right here's our cosmic light horizon, okay? It's the boundary of the observable universe. It's as far back as we can see absolutely anything, okay? And so, the galaxies that are outside, all right, their light has been traveling for 13.7 billion years, but they're so far away, the light hasn't reached us yet, okay? So the universe isn't infinitely old. There are light from galaxies that haven't even reached us, okay? And the other thing about this is that light from distant galaxies contains very little energy. By the time it gets to us, it's so low energy, it doesn't brighten up the galaxy. It actually makes the galaxy a lot less visible. So, um, essentially, Olber's paradox can be explained by the fact that we hadn't even seen everything out there. 
I mean, that's one thing. Um, and then things that are out there, sometimes we can't see them because the energy that's coming from this is way too low. Okay. So how far back do we actually know anything at all? Now, I don't know how they figured this out, but there's a specific time, it's called the Planck time, immediately after the Big Bang, that space and time began to behave as they do. So the laws of physics, you know, um, e, e equals mc squared, f equals ma, all began to behave like this at 1.35 times 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang. Okay. But they had no clue what happened in that, you know, time right before that. They have no clue. But at this point, we know, we start to know what's going on. So they say. <laughs> okay. So, um, now how do we know that there was a Big Bang at all? Okay, they come up with this weird time, the Planck time, time before which we know nothing. But they, they do know things, okay? So um, Dickey and Peebles at um, Princeton knew that the early universe had to be really, really hot. And if it was really, really hot, there would be all these high energy <coughs> photons floating around. So down the street from them, Penzias and Wilson of Bell Labs were doing some kind of radio to satellite communications and they had this nice beautiful large feed horn here and they were pointing it everywhere in the sky and they kept getting this radiation, this, this feedback. And they were baffled, they were like, what on earth is this? Well, all those high energy photons that were in the very beginning of the um, universe, all of those were still here, but they had been shifted, all right? redshifted to the point where they were now in the millimeter part of the spectrum. All right, they weren't high energy anymore. They'd shifted to low energy photons, but they were everywhere. And these guys got, I think it was 1978, they got the Nobel Prize for finding what's called the cosmic microwave background. And that is evidence for the Big Bang because all this radiation was left, was left over, okay? And Kobe, which is the cosmic microwave background explorer spacecraft, went out and did lots of measurements. And when they plotted it, it's a black body spectrum. A black body is a perfect um, absorber of radiation. Black body curves give us an idea of the peak wavelength of a certain temperature of a black body. Our sun is a black body. Its black body curve is at 5,800 Kelvin. That's the surface temperature of our sun. And it peaks in the visible around green. So 400 something nanometers or 450 nanometers or so. But this one, okay, the, the um, curve here is for 2.725 Kelvin. And that is the temperature of our microwave background. So when I do my radio astronomy measurements, I have to subtract off this microwave background because it's everywhere. But it is evidence for this, this big bang. So during the first 380,000 years, after the Big Bang, the universe was a hot, opaque plasma, which means before 380,000 years, we can't see anything, all right? It was opaque to that point. And photons were the radiation, and luminous and non-luminous objects were considered to be matter. Now let's look at what happened um, in terms of radiation versus matter. Right now, the mass density of radiation rose to Brad, all right, is calculated to be 4.6 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms per meter cube, and our average density of matter is greater than that, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 27. Now, it wasn't always that way. 24,000 years after the Big Bang, and up to that point, radiation is what dominated our universe. And then at a certain point, those two values were equal, and now, in our universe, it's a matter-dominated universe. So we know now we have a matter-dominated universe, but it gets even stranger. Because <laughs> we're not in a we're not in a matter-dominated universe anymore. It's changed now. So at some point the temperature of the background radiation cooled to 3,000 Kelvin. The universe glowed orange. It was probably quite pretty, alright. And the temperature was cool enough for protons and electrons to combine into hydrogen atoms, alright? And so that's what we have going on here, all right? This is before the first atoms. After that recombination, we have the first atoms that were forming, forming our hydrogen atoms. 
And so here before, temperatures were too high, all right, for these um, uh, subatomic particles to bind to one another. After recombination, the temperatures were low enough for these atoms to form. And then at that point, the universe became transparent and we could, that's all right, we could see. Now, how about the shape of our universe? Looking at the mass distribution can tell us something about the shape of our universe. Now, we know gravity curves space, and matter and energy produce gravity. Energy is related to mass through Einstein's e equals mc squared. So that cool formula does actually have use, other than commercials and all kinds of other uses. Matter and energy across space produce curvature. So if we want to look at our universe, the degree of curvature depends on what's called the combined average mass density, which is rho sub zero, of all forms of matter and energy. So zero is, zero curvature means we have a flat universe, positive means we have a closed universe, and negative curvature gives us an open universe. Another pra uh, parameter is the critical density. And that's a re reference density that we can use to compare to the um, um, the mass density we were looking at, and if it's less than it, we have a negative curvature open. If they're equal, the universe is flat, and if this one's greater, I'm sorry for these extra things, I don't know where they came from, we have positive curvature closed. And then, the cosmologists use something called the density parameter that is a ratio of these. And so, the space we're in is spherical, if the matter um, density is greater than the critical density, and this density parameter is greater than one, if you were to shine two parallel light beams, they'd ultimately converge, which means we have a closed universe. If they're equal, uh, the density parameter is equal to one, and it's flat, those two beams are going to go on forever. And if it's less than, and our density parameter is less than one, the space is hyperbolic, and those parallel beams diverge, they'll never close back in on one another again. So our universe is open. And so these are just some of the um, parameters, spherical, flat, hyperbolic, the curvature that's associated with them, the type of universe we have, and those uh, mass density and density parameters. Now, how do we measure the curvature? Well, about that C um, cosmic microwave background. Okay, we can look at hot spots, and the hot spots in the cosmic microwave background are due to density variations that occurred in the early universe. So that's what we're seeing through here. So that's a you know hot spot, a cold spot, a hot spot, a cold spot. And the size of the hot spot can tell us about the shape of the universe. So if the universe is closed, the bending of light by the hot spots will make the image smaller, and vice versa. So as a result, the hot spot appears larger if the universe is closed. I think I put that, that, I did that backwards, sorry. So if it's closed, all right, the image will appear larger. If it's flat, the, the spot won't bend anything at all. And if it's open, the spot will appear smaller than it actually is. Now, our density parameter is almost equal to one, so our universe is flat, or almost flat, okay? Um, and there are a couple of things about that that are a little weird, and we'll talk about that shortly. So this is a kicker right here, too. We can look at the mass density parameter and estimate how much of our universe is represented by matter and radiation. Well, here's our um, um, parameter that deals with our matter. And we can look at our matter versus our critical density and it's 0.24. So radiation, luminous, and all the dark matter account for only 24% of the density of the universe. 24%! What accounts for the rest of it? Dark energy, okay? So there's also a dark energy density parameter, okay? Now, if we take the density parameter here to be one, subtract off the stuff from matter that we're familiar with, our universe that we know, we're left with 76.76, which is 76%. The dark energy accounts for 76% of our energy density of our universe. And we have no clue what it is. That scares me somehow. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be scared, but 
Um, and dark energy is very much like Einstein's cosmological constant, all right? His value was just way too low, but we think it's definitely some kind of pressure that's causing our universe to expand and accelerate. So our universe is accelerating, okay? We have plots here, two uh, universes with different expansion rates. So we have a slow and a rapid expansion, okay? And this is a plot of recessional velocity for galaxies within 400 megaparsecs or 1.3 billion light years. And so over short time scales, the expansion here appears uniform. And then you can look at three expansion scenarios, okay? This one um, expands more slowly. Um, in the past, the expansion has sped up. This would be constant rate. And this corresponds to a universe that expanded more rapidly and has slowed down. Well, let's look at our, um, what we can look at with data and see what our data tell us. So we have to do something called relativistic cosmology, okay? And so we're looking at type 1a supernovae. They're the supernovae where the white dwarf gets a bunch of stuff piled on it and it explodes. Okay, these are particularly bright and we can use these to measure distances to really far away galaxies because they are that luminous when they go off. And they took a lot of data, well, these many data points that we can see here, there's some error bars in there too, but from these type um, A supernova, the apparent magnitude versus redshift. And if the expansion is speeding up, the data will be in the blue. Okay, if it's slowing down, it'll be in the red. And this data assumes a flat universe with no dark energy. This is um, a flat universe with dark energy, which is us. Everything shows up in the blue. So it says essentially that our universe is speeding up. Okay? And so the cosmological constant is essentially then, Einstein really didn't um, make a mistake. He just calculated a number that was too small is now the energy that's associated with space itself, okay? And how does energy arise from empty space? Well, could be virtual particle pairs. That's one of the things that they um, thought about. But unfortunately, um, if we were to use these virtual particle pairs to explain dark energy, the effects of par uh, pair production and for a constant that would be much higher than what's observed. So we honestly don't know what dark energy is, okay? Just this. Now, the early universe, all right, was essentially a fluid, okay? A fluid of, of plasma, okay? And sound waves travel through gases and fluids, all right? And sound waves are compression waves. So if I bang on this, I'm, I'm setting up compression waves in the wood that have what are called compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are dense regions and rarefactions are very um, sparse regions, okay, of your wave. And so in the first 380,000 years, the universe was filled with protons, photons, and electrons. Collisions between these particles produced sound waves in the early universe, which we can now study, okay? And so um, you can see here we have data points coming from the cosmic microwave background hot and cold spots in the background that give us a specific size. And these are the, the density variations that we're looking on, looking at. Photons from the compressions gravitationally shifted to longer wavelength. So our blue regions, our compressions, came from the compressions, and the red regions came from rarefactions. And so the sound waves tell us the proper of uh, some um, information about the properties of the fluid that made up the early universe. It gives us information about average densities of matter and dark matter, dark energy, about the Hubble constant at that time, and about the age of the universe at that time when the CMD was emitted. And it also determines how large a hotspot can be, which they found is about one degree, one degree in size. So they think that from these, these um, hot spots, which are density fluctuations in the medium, some are more dense than others. These density fluctuations are what ultimately formed these dense networks and ultimately formed our galaxies. Whoa. 
Next, please. Sorry, I'm just taking a picture. So some of the key properties from the universe, um, Hubble constant, density parameter, all those have been figured out to a fairly good margin. We have some plus or minuses here, but we have uh, some of the numbers we've been talking about. Recombination um, occurred at a, um, Z equals 1100, um, and that's about as far back as we can see as Z equals 1100. Okay. So, um, there's a problem, um, it's called the iso isotropy problem and the flatness problem, okay? Now, one problem. Here's our cosmic light horizon, and we look at A and B, and radiation from both of those points looks exactly the same. Well, that doesn't quite match up. How can those two points that far apart be in thermal equilibrium, okay? That's a problem. Now, for the universe to be flat, our density parameter had to be near one, which meant the mass density and the critical density had to be very, very, very close to being equal. How did that happen at the very beginning of the universe? Very beginning of the Big Bang. Well, um, a couple of things happened, and one was the inflationary model. They came up with the inflationary model to explain something that explains both of those, those problems. Um, the universe had a very brief period, 10 to the minus 12 seconds of inflation. And during that period, the universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the 50. So what that means is the radiation of those two parts, A and B, in that diagram, were in intimate contact before the universe expanded and sent them off. So by virtue of the fact that they were in contact at one time, they could, they could be in thermal equilibrium. Okay, that's our... Um, isotropy problem. And as far as um, flatness, here we have um, an expanding uh, sphere and its curvature ultimately, by the time you expand far enough, everything starts to appear flat. Okay? And so um, that kind of explained that stuff off. But what actually triggered the inflation? Okay, well, we kind of have to look at the four fundamental forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, which holds protons and neutrons together, and the weak force, which is a short-range force involved in radioactive decay. We also have to look at quantum electrodynamics, which says that charged particles interact through virtual photons. Mm -hmm. They come together, they interact through these virtual photons. We don't see it, we don't know it, but that's what's going on, okay? And so the electroweak force was a unification of force for particles having <coughs> greater than 100 giga electron volts. So particles that are slammed together with that energy experience the electromagnetic and the weak forces indistinguishably. So at that energy, you can't tell the difference between the electromagnetism and the weak force. So they are essentially unified above 100 um, giga electron volts. Now that represents to the physicist symmetry. All right. Below 100 giga electron volts, these two um, forces separate, and the symmetry is broken. Now, also, we figured out uh, we found the Higgs particle. For anybody interested, the Higgs particle is what gives mass to other particles by interacting with them. My rapidly growing weight, thank you, Higgs, is somehow um, tangled up with the Higgs boson. <laughs> And so <laughs> I can blame the Higgs now. That's why I'm blaming the Higgs. That's a good one. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> they won't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I'm ready for And then they've been looking for grand unified theories, all right? At energies of, I don't know why this wouldn't, I did this several times to get it to, but it's 10 to the 14, not 1,014 giga electron volts. That's silly. 10 to the 14 giga electron volts. It's possible that strong, weak, and electromagnetic force may be indistinguishable. So they're trying to find a place where these are, well, indistinguishable. Here, at the very beginning, all right, all four forces were equally strong, okay? Gravity became distinct here, right in here, and then some place over here, um, we have the strong force, the electromagnetic, and the weak force bro broke off here. So early on, all right, there was enough energy to have these things unified. Gravity froze out at 10 to the 19 giga electron volts. The strong force breaks off at 10 to the 14, and at 100, all four forces 
are distinct. Now, what triggered the inflation? Well, if we're sitting here, um, this is the energy associated with the inflation field because the inflation was actually, hey, they have typo, don't they? Huh. <laughs> um, inflation field. So initially, here's our universe is in what they call the false vacuum state, all right? It gets a slow roll towards this um, lower energy true vacuum state, and that um, releasing energy as it comes down in here is what caused the expansion, that rapid expansion. And then it rolls back and forth here, all right, and settling to a minimum energy, which is everything likes to be in a minimum energy state. You know, we don't like to be excited all the time. We can't keep that up. And so, um, the particle production in the first particles, how are our first particles produced, okay? Well, all the time, and in this room, what's going on is virtual uh, pair production. Um, these particles and antiparticles are produced, and they destroy one another all the time. It's happening all the time. It might be happening on my cheek right now, but it's happening all the time. And so, um, these pairs occur, and what happened, they think, was just before inflation, this was going on, but the partners got pulled so far apart that they became real particles. And so at first there was a lot of matter, antimatter destruction, but then with the, when this happened, for every 10 to the 9 antiprotons, there must have been 10 to the 9 plus 1 protons, okay? And so now we start to have our, our atoms. At 10 to minus 6, there was a quark confinement. The quarks formed protons and neutrons. In the first two seconds after the Big Bang, protons and electrons formed neutrons. And by three minutes, three minutes, people, I don't know how they have that down to the time, but after the Big Bang, the protons outnumbered the neutrons and rapidly um, combined to form helium. All right. So all the hydrogen, all the helium, some lithium, and some beryllium nuclei were formed. And that was it in the Big Bang. That's it. Everything else that has come out has come from stars, all right? So it fairly rapidly reached the present day one helium atom per 10 hydrogen, all right? And 15 minutes after the Big Bang, the universe was no longer hot enough to form atoms through nucleosynthesis, and atom formation stopped for now, all right? And so what about the galaxies and the first stars? Well, there's something called the genes link, and we can look at fluctuations in the matter of the early universe. And as they were stretched during inflation, the initial clumping that formed them, we see today, okay? And so there's something called the genes link, which describes the length over which a fluctuation must span in order to grow. And if the fluctuation is longer than the genes link, that will grow and most likely become a galaxy or something like that. So these fluctuations are larger than the genes length. Fluctuations larger than the genes length have become denser. And so that's what they think um, was required for um, these fluctuations to be large enough to actually form the first stars and ultimately the first galaxies. So what about that first generation of stars? Well, we call them population three stars. That's the first generation. Population two stars are very metal poor stars. We see them a lot in globular clusters, okay? Population three stars are stars like our sun. They're full of metals. Um, we see them in open clusters and stuff like that. They're, they're not often in globular clusters. Globular clusters are very old clusters of stars. And so the original, I don't know why they did it, one, two, and three. I would have done it one, two, and three the other way. Don't ask me, but. And so these were the zeroth generation big stars. And here are nearby stars. And if we um, essentially blank all that out and look here, this, all this infrared light is from very distant primordial stars or these population three stars, okay? And these stars only contained hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, because that's all that was there to form them. And they had to overcome great intracloud pressure to collapse. So these were monster stars. I'm talking a thousand solar masses. We can't get stars over 200 solar masses now. They blow apart, all right? So 30 to 1,000 solar masses, and they essentially reionized the universe around 400 million years after the Big Bang. And these guys were so massive, there are no 
pulsars, black holes, or anything. They just blew themselves apart, essentially. So, we have the cosmic microwave background. Here's our Big Bang. Here's, 40, here's the dark ages. That's when we couldn't see anything, essentially. Here's first light. And then we have out, here's another, here's a Hubble Deep Field. I'm sure most, if you haven't seen Hubble Deep Field for the new people, look on hubblesite.org and you'll blow your mind with all the beautiful galaxies. There are billions of galaxies. So how did our galaxies form in the um, manner that we see them now? Well, you could look at either hot dark matter or cold dark matter simulations. The, simulated, the people that have done the simulations have stuck with the cold dark matter simulations using WIMPs, which are <coughs> weakly interacting massive particles. And um, these guys, we may think that's what makes up dark matter, all right? They did a simulation, begins 120 million years after the Big Bang, and after they let it run, we come up with this structure, something we're all familiar with if we look at maps of the universe, we see this very filamentous um, spiderweb-like structure. And so they think what it is with this WIMP model is a bottom-up galaxy formation, all right? The colors indicate the gas density here. So we get all of our filaments like we see. Along these filaments are where we get our galaxies forming, and in the bigger ones we get our clusters, all right? And if we look back at uh, Redshift 2.2, we're looking 3 billion years after the Big Bang. We're looking that far back. This is so cool. We can see galaxies under construction. And the James Webb is going to be able to see all the way out to our cosmic light horizon. So can we go back? These are under construction. We're seeing so far back, we're seeing galaxies forming. So when we get James Webb up there, we're going to be able to look back. And some of them are so red-shifted, they're, they're red in color. Oh, so great. So those things are under construction. The last two things I'm going to talk about, um, no, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. And then I'll shut up. So we're familiar with the idea of space-time as four dimensions, as produced by Einstein, the X, Y, Z, and T, time being the fourth. And in 1919, uh, Theodore Kaluza proposed a fifth dimension. And so he was looking at um, combining forces, and he hoped he could describe gravity and electromagnetism in terms of the curvature of a fifth dimension. Okay? Now, during the time that he was doing this, he only knew of gravity and electromagnetism. Um, Edward Witten of Princeton suggested there that there may be up to 10 dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Okay? And models that attempt to unify, the, unify these forces of nature in quantum gravity are called, not strong theory, string <laughs> theory. <laughs> strong string theory. Strong string theory, or super strong theory, super string theory, <laughs> or M theory. Okay? And so, if there are 11 dimensions, there must be massive particles we have yet to discover. That's what they've come up with. And they've shown these dimensions as you have a grid, and there are all these tiny spherical um, dimensions that are in a grid work, essentially. I love this. This is so mind-blowing. All right? And so there are all these. They're so small we can't see them. They're curled up, these dimensions. And so some ideas that come from these new theories are that electrons and quarks may not actually be particles at all. Okay? But membranes are strings wrapped tightly around the... Um, extra dimensions of space so tightly that they look like points to us. Okay? I need to read more on this. This is fascinating. All right? I didn't know about this. The mem uh, electron is a membrane wrapped around a, a, another dimension. Okay, great. So um, that's what they think. And like guitar strings vibrate in many ways, these strings vibrate corresponding to a particular type of particle that they are. Okay? Anybody know anything about string theory? How many people believe it? Yeah, I don't know why I wouldn't. I don't really have any idea. But anyway, can we go back to that real quick? Now this is a, um, a 2D slice of a 6D Kalabi Yao quintic manifold, all right? It's some kind of strange um, space that has many dimensions, and these are the kind of forms these crazy mathematicians that work with this stuff come out with. So this is the kind of structure you'd have in many, many, many dimensions. So, beautiful. Now, what's ultimately going to happen with us? Well, 
the death of the universe with a big rip. I think it was 2001 when I heard from Time Magazine that we weren't going to have a big crunch, we were going to keep expanding, and that hurt. It hurt me here. <laughs> it did. It hurt me here. Because I wanted a big crunch. Somehow a big crunch and everything just keeps going. When I found out that weren't going to happen, it really, it really, really affected me. But uh, this is considered the plausible fate of our universe, okay? So heat death essentially means everything is spread out, so there's no thermodynamic free energy, no processes that can increase energy, no work can be done. I mean, work as in, you know, force times distance is work, you know? Not that go out and mow the lawn, we can't do anything because there's no free energy hanging around, okay? Now that's one thing that could happen. You just get into total thermodynamic equilibrium and there's really nothing going on. The other thing is a big rip. Now the big rip, everything, including galaxies, would be torn apart, even space-time. All right, boo, I don't like that. How long might that happen? Just wait about 22 billion years, all right? And that's based on a lot of parameters that cosmologists use. We don't know for certain, but this is an estimate. So if you hang out for another 22 billion years, you might be involved in a big rip where even atoms are going to be torn apart. So I don't like that one either. I don't like that one either. So hopefully they're going to find something that we get a big crunch and I'll be happy and I go to my grave being happy. Otherwise, it's just kind of dismal. <laughs> dismal. So anyway, that's where we started. It's kind of a quick and dirty through the, through the uh, evolution of our universe and down to what might ultimately... Sorry for the bad news. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you something that was going to happen. Spoiler alert. <laughs> that's all I have. Any questions? Oh yeah, no, I'm as prepared as I'm ever going to be. <laughs> At what point after the, the Big Bang do we know the laws of physics were set down? As it we should know have been it. at the Planck time. That's what they say. The laws of okay. physics started to work at that time. Heads up, watch call. Yes, sir. The newest star I read about is a blue star. Okay. And it's like, I don't know how big that was, but like, what kind of... Uh, you were talking about there were different nebulas where there was like different metals and things. Like what kind of nebula would like a blue star grow into? Um, any kind of H2 region or nebula that's forming stars like the Orion Nebula forms all kinds of stars. And a blue star would be, well, it could be a number of different things. But there are O and B stars, which are huge stars that form. They don't live very long because they're so big, but they do form in, in associations in these large clouds of gas. So any cloud of gas that's forming could form one of those stars. Um, but there are other blue stars, blue stragglers, which is um, our sun will be probably be a blue straggler. It's a part of the horizontal branch that a star goes off on. It becomes a temperature so that it is blue and then it comes back over. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that's in my head. It'll come back over to a red giant phase. So yeah, it can be blue then too. So. It's already green. Huh? Yeah. It's already green. <laughs> Yes, sir. You uh, said globular clusters were uh, had a unique uh, characteristic in their age. Uh -huh. uh, can you explain, you know, well, how they're, they're unique? They're older clusters, and all of them are located in the halo. So it means that they were um, some they were formed in the mid plane, and somehow they've all migrated out to the halo. I don't know that we know so much about them. I'm not a globular cluster expert. But they do contain older stars, they're not forming any stars. There's no gas or anything left in them. So they have about a million, million stars. I think there's about a billion stars in a globular cluster. But they're just old, there's no gas or dust. And they must have formed early on in the galaxy when it was forming and they've migrated to the halo. All the open clusters are in the mid-plane. So that's as much as I know about them. So. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. If you have any questions about any of the things that you heard here tonight, uh, feel free to grab one of us on the way out. Um, also, don't forget this Saturday, Harrison Bay Star Party. Uh, if it rains it out, I'll be there at 8 o'clock. I'll probably get there around 7.30. Uh, 8 o'clock, we'll have a discussion. I'm going to talk about Mars and its... Uh, 
it, the opposition when it's coming and also the fact that it's on a cycle it'll be closest to the earth it'll be I think in 18 years so um, if uh, you know that how many AU it'll be from us? Um, I don't off the top of my head I gotta figure that out before Saturday but I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be asked that's right uh, any, anything else? Anything else? Thank you all for coming and uh, drop me a message, shoot me an email. Don't forget to send me some pictures for the next newsletter. Thank you. Twenty-eight, twenty-seven, or twenty-eight. I might have missed. We had four that left. There's two more. We're not there. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, man. Doing all right. Doing great. Oh my goodness.